and we are live. And I cannot tell my audience how super, super excited, honored, um, and lucky I am to be uh, interviewing today one of my author heroes, Pat Zitlow Miller. Did I get all your names right? You did. It's perfect. No, the Zitlo is easy. It's the Path and the Miller that are difficult. That's what I found, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, welcome to the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. Pat, it's so great to have you. Oh, thank you. I'm really excited to be doing this. And you've, you've published in the past eight or nine years about two dozen books. Yes, I have. For children. <laughs> Uh, wow. Um, and, and we're here to celebrate your new one, In Our Garden, which uh, launches? It came out on March 15th, so it's been in the world just about two weeks now. Oh, wonderful. So, um, yeah. as we do say, uh, Mazel Tov. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure that you had a garden party for your launch. Well, okay, I'm sitting in Wisconsin and it's snowing right now outside. There is snow. So no, we aren't quite at garden season yet. <laughs> so that'll have to be a little later. <laughs> okay. Um, you, don't have to, you don't happen to have a copy of the book to uh, show yes, everybody. I have it right here in our garden. And um, I obviously wrote the words and Melissa Crutton is the illustrator and she lives in Utah. And I think it's probably a little warmer where she is. Uh, the book is gorgeous. Um, the uh, it's wonderful, and um, why don't you tell us a few words about it? Sure. So um, I grew up in a family. My parents were huge gardeners, um, both in terms of growing things that looked pretty and in terms of growing a lot of food. So we had a huge garden in our backyard: um, cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes. You know, all all kinds of things. Um, even though I spent a lot of my childhood, you know, helping my parents with that garden, I didn't really inherit the gardening gene. Um, everything I try to grow now that I'm an adult uh, dies. Um, but I thought it would be great to write a book about um, a garden at a school because I had been in some cities and seen rooftop gardens and thought they were really cool. So the book is about um, a girl who comes to, to the U.S. from another country and misses the rooftop garden that she had back home. And as she's trying to settle into her new environments and her new country, she suggests that her school create a rooftop garden and the whole community and school comes together to uh, make a rooftop garden. And it helps the girl, you know, figure out that it's possible to bloom where you're planted. Wonderful. Um, so you have this, um, this garden shtick because uh, Sophie's squash is about a squash, right? It is. You know, I think it's funny that for someone who really can't, grow anything that so many of my books have that gardening theme to them. Um, but I think it's more about like what gardens represent than the actual garden themselves, you know, new growth and opportunity and possibility. Um, and I think, you know, that's why it appeals to me on, on some level as a writer. And then Sophie Squash was inspired by real life. Um, my youngest daughter carried a butternut squash around and put a face on it and loved it. Um, and then I wrote the book and once the book came out, I heard from so many parents whose kids had done the same thing, which I always thought my daughter was like just a little quirky, um, but, she, but you know, she, actually there were more kids out there like her than I had anticipated. And it was kind of cool. So um, does she get some of the royalties, which are uh, accumulating as royalties, we speak? But I am paying for her college and some of my paying for her college comes out of the royalties. <clears throat> she's 20 now. She uh -huh. no longer carries a squash around, um, you know, but, but she's very proud of it. And um at big life moments, like when she graduated from high school, I, I make her take a picture with the squash and she humors me and lets me do it. Her, is her name Sophie? Her name is Sonia. So it's close. And the reason I went with Sophie instead of Sonia is because when you read it out loud, Sophie's squash reads, in my opinion, a little easier than Sonia's squash, but the book's dedicated to Sonia. So her name is in the book. Mm -hmm. So sometime we'll have to interview her. How, how is it to be the character in the book? In a book, I, exactly. <laughs> I, I hope she, I hope she's okay with it. She is okay with it. When she was little, when the book came out, she was a little disappointed that Sophie didn't look like her. Um, but now that she's an adult, you know, she's she's cool. So, and um, the other uh, crazy thing is, you grew up in uh, Oshkosh. I did. <laughs> um, which is named after the the famous overalls. Yes. <laughs> and and they don't really have a long summer, do they? 
No, no. I mean, I've lived in Wisconsin my whole life and, you know, you have a couple nice days and then you have a lot of like not so nice days. So yeah, not a long summer. So your, your parents must have been very optimistic people to be gardeners. Yes, they made it work. I mean, they really did. We took advantage of every nice day and, you know, my mom canned and preserved. And, and so we had, you know, we had all kinds of stuff all year long that she had grown. Uh, tell me more about your childhood. I'm always intrigued in uh, how writers of picture books grew up. Okay, well, I grew up um, in some ways in a very <clears throat> traditional family. Um, my dad worked at a grocery store. My mom had been an English teacher, but then she stayed home after she had my brother, my sister, and me. Um, and I think my biggest memories of childhood, which kind of probably predicted my future, was um, I would go to the bookmobile, but like there was there was a library in the middle of town, but I couldn't always get there, and especially when I was little. So a bookmobile came around and it would like park three blocks from my house twice a week, and my sister and I would walk there, and we and my parents would let us do it because it was close and it was safe, and we'd check out as many books as we could carry, and we'd take them home and read them, and then you know, so I mean, I lived at the bookmobile growing up. And I really think it, you know, I mean, just it, it, that love of reading, the love of story, you know, just going off into some other location for a while was just wonderful. And, and my parents also, which I think was really important, they didn't overly monitor what I read. I read all kinds of stuff. I read kids books. I read adult books, maybe before I shouldn't, but it all, I mean, it was good for me. So every time I hear people saying, well, kids shouldn't read that. I mean, they're probably going to be fine. You know, I mean, I read all kinds of stuff and it made me uh, a smarter person, a much better vocabulary, a better writer. Um, it was good for me. Okay. And what, what were you like as a five-year-old? Because today you write for five-year-olds. Yeah. Okay. When I was a five-year-old, I was a really shy and timid kid. And I think that's part of the reason I liked escaping into other worlds, you know, because I could be braver in a story. Um, I really was a shy and timid kid. I, I remember going to kindergarten and just being really, really scared. Um, and I have a twin sister, so she was with me and that helped. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I lived in my head a lot as a kid. You know, I had a lot of imagination and a lot of dreaming and that didn't always maybe translate really well into the, the day-to-day world, especially when I was small. But, um, but then, you know, I caught up and everything worked out all right. <laughs> yeah, but do you feel that you're somehow writing to the five-year-old Path at least once in a while? Absolutely. Um, one of my books, When You Are Brave, is basically a letter to five-year-old me. Um, you know, because some kids, like my oldest daughter, she was the kid who was going headfirst down the slide, you know, charging forward into life. That wasn't me. Um, and so, yeah, so When You Are Brave, Remarkable You is probably written to five-year-old me. And I think something that I do and that that other writers do is, you know, you can, you remember, I mean, Writers have, I think, very strong memories of, of the emotions of childhood. And I really remember the strong feelings that I had as a kid. Um, and I think if you can remember that and channel it, you know, because emotions don't change over time, even though I was five, you know, a long, long time ago, five-year-olds today still feel some of those same big emotions. Wow. So another argument for the importance of the limbic brain in writing. Yes, you've wow. got to be able to remember yourself as a kid and, wow. and how big things were and how big things seemed and how big you felt. Yeah, and how, how you felt, how big or yeah. how small or how, or how small you felt. Yeah, or were ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. OK, but then uh, you grew it up. And what happened when you grew it up? OK, well, I'll think about this. So um, I well, this is interesting. I went to college. And I was an English and a journalism major. And my goal was going to be, I was going to be a sports writer at the Chicago Tribune. That was my, my goal. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I worked at the local newspaper and I was a sports writer for the local newspaper. But I always like, I was always reading picture books, even when I was in college. You know, I just thought they were cool. And when I was 19, I wrote my first draft of a picture book. You know, and this was like, I mean, I had a typewriter. Computers were not around then. Um, so I, I typed it out and I mailed it off to one publisher. And a couple months later, I got a form rejection. And I didn't do anything then for like 20 years. I mean, I mean, related to picture books. I mean, I, I, I worked as a journalist. I was a sports reporter, never at the Chicago Tribune, but at other papers. Um, but I always had that picture book thing kind of hanging around in the back of my head. And then when I was like 39, one, one so second, 20, Pat. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, did, yeah. No, don't be sorry. Um, did that rejection put you off from writing? Well, I did. I wasn't upset about it. You know, I, it was more like, oh, well, I tried. But because I was only 19, 
I think I thought, well, I tried and they said no. So, you know, it's over. You know, I, I didn't realize that so much of writing was trying and trying again and getting rejected. I just thought, well, I tried, they said no. So I'll, you know, do something else. Um, but when I was 39, I went like, you know, okay, I didn't really try. I tried once. <laughs> so I, um, then I really started like treating it like it was a part-time job. Like every evening I was writing, I was reading, I was, you know, researching because now the internet existed and I could like figure out what I was doing. Um, and that's when my picture book career really started was when I was 39 and said, if I don't try this, it's what I'm going to regret when I'm older. Wow. I should have met you earlier because it took me <laughs> 64 years to reach the same conclusion. Wow. So, and, 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 yeah. and did you realize that there was a lot to learn? Because, oh, you know, absolutely. Because, because, you know, you had this career, you were a, write, a reporter and a writer, and you could have said, oh, I'm, I'm really good. I just need one or two tweaks. You know, I've, I've met aspiring writers that do that. They're like, well, you know, I mean, and I'm making this up, but they're like, I have a PhD in psychology. I know how to write. But knowing how to write and then writing for kids is such a different thing. I mean, yeah, I had, you know, I was a paid writer for all of my career. But when you're a journalist, you know, you're reporting on facts and you're quoting people and making up a story from the ground up and, you know, plot and structure and hearts and voice. That's so different. Um, so I think I had maybe a leg up because I knew how to put words together, but I had so much to learn in terms of telling the story and then even picture book structure. Because, you know, how many pages are a picture book? How do you work the page turns? Um, a lot. I had a lot to learn. And luckily, I knew that. But then the other benefit of having been a journalist is I knew how to find things out. Like I knew how to research. And so I just treated it like it was a project. And I jumped in and I did tons of research. Um, and I think that more than anything helped me succeed because I went in and I, you know, I found the answers and then I practiced a ton. So um, practicing, uh, take us uh, forward slowly towards uh, Sophie and uh, this, uh, I, I call it a perfect children's book. I, I think it's a, uh, it's going to be an eternal classic. Well, thank you. Uh, I and mean, I just feel so lucky that that was my first book and it had that level of success right out of the gate. I mean, I had a ton of books that I had tried submitting before Sophie that I thought at the time were ready, but looking back, they weren't. I was still learning the craft and learning what I was doing. Um, but when I started working on Sophie, I mean, the book, that, that the final book, it's probably the 10th version of Sophie. You know, the first versions were, you know, just beginning attempts, but even the beginning attempts got like some positive comments and some positive interest to keep me going and to keep me like, you know, really working on getting it right. But yeah, that book is really important to me because it's a tribute to my daughter. It got my career started. Um, and even though, like you Pat, said, I've had it, tons of books. That, that's a tiny bit of an understatement. <laughs> what, which part? That it, it helped get your career started, dear. It made you a stellar, <laughs> world-famous writer. Now's the time to be a little less modest. Um, I, I'm not going to ask you how many books you've sold, but... Um, if, I honestly if, don't know the answer to that question anyway. <laughs> um, is, there, is there a language that it hasn't been translated into? Um, is there an award that you haven't won for that book? <laughs> it did really well. <laughs> <laughs> We, we talked we talked about it because it's it's just the right book to love no it's still the picture book that i want to hug you know i mean i just like you know <laughs> and and it's when people tell me that i wrote their favorite book they're almost always talking about sophie splash so but uh, don't you want to share a little bit uh, more about how it came about by the way 10 versions cat, of I'm a sorry, book uh, um you don't know yiddish but 10 versions of a book is garnished it's nothing it's Bobkus, you know. <laughs> I know that uh, one. You know, writers will, will revise things a hundred times. Yes. So yeah, that's true. So you had this, you, I, I'm almost going to say you had this down path, but I'll get shot for that. Um, <laughs> right from the get-go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I had the idea and I knew sort of the plot of the story. And then it was just a matter of like, you know, getting the pieces in the right order and, and getting the level of humor right. And it had a couple different endings. Um, and, and I think what's funny You had is, different endings. I did. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> Getting the ending right was probably the hardest part. I mean, the very first version ended with, you know, the squash gut mushy and gross. And then her parents went to the grocery store and just bought her like a truckload full of more squash. That, that was how it ended the first time. You know, so she was surrounded by zucchini and, you know, all the different kinds of squash. <laughs> it's not squash. <stopping. laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, and I'm trying to think. And then it was just like, I, the idea of planting it and having the new squash grow was really when like it all started to come together, you know? Um, and, and I really, Sophie had to solve the problem herself. Her parents couldn't say like, okay, let's put the squash in the garden. So then going back to the farmer's market and talking to the farmer and getting the idea to plant the squash is when it sort of started coming together. Well, and Madison, where I live, has a huge farmer's market that it's known for. Um, and so the idea for that kind of came from there. And there's so many things I love about that, uh, that book. Um, but the, so, oh, wow. Um, I have a bunch of questions to ask you. Um, I, you know, I, I've read what you've written about your influences. Um, but I, I don't be angry with me, but I read... In Sophie, I read a little bit of, of Robert Munch. Oh, thank you. That's a wonderful thing to say. Uh, so I, because, you know, I, it, like the, the best of Robert is in that book also. I read him to my children when they were small. So I'm sure that there's some of that in there because we had several of his books. Uh, so um, that was one of the things I had to tell you. The other thing is, I am intrigued. So, you know, you've told everybody um, that the idea for the squash uh, came from your daughter. Um, you still had to say, oh, you know, that's a really great idea for a book. Yeah. Do, do you remember the moment that that happened? Not the specific moment. I, I remember a lot when, when my daughter was carrying the squash around that I was just struck by like the oddness and the quirkiness of it. But, you know, I let her go because it was adorable. Um, and she carried other things around too. Like she carried around like a bag of flour, which always made me really nervous. Cause if that dropped and fell, I mean, you know, poof, it would have been like a huge mess. Um, so I can't remember the exact moment, but I always, I think I knew there was something there that that oddness, um, would maybe carry over. No, but I, do, you, do you remember the second that you said, oh my goodness, I, I was, I was thinking of using a four letter word, but I don't think you do. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. There's a story here. I wish I did, but I don't remember the exact. Is it, isn't that, that something? Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm thinking, you know, you could you could write a you could write a Sophie Squash a day. Yeah. <laughs> if you could figure out the moment you had the idea, but but right. basically that's what's so hard to do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I, I'll be talking about this on Sunday, and I'd like to quote you on this. Sure. Oh, wonderful, uh, and. Um, and the other brilliant idea, of course, you know, having a, a great idea for a children's book is one thing. And then, you know, the, the arc and so on. But then there's another genius, which is bringing it back home, the ending of the story. Right. And I don't know which is cleverer, the idea of the squash or the idea at the end of the story when uh, all of a sudden she sees uh, her, 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 her grandchildren. Yes. <laughs> so Sophie's squash is squash. Yes. <laughs> I and mean, I think the twins, the twins, the twins, Bonnie and Baxter. <laughs> who were just the right size. Yes. So do you remember how that happened? Well, I mean, I had come up with the idea of planting the squash and having it grow. And that came out of like visiting the Madison farmer's market and thinking about what would a kid left to their own devices do when the squash got mushy and gross. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, cause I mean, I knew enough about composting that, you know, if a squash broke down there's seeds inside and, and something might grow. And so I thought, well, okay, then there could be Bonnie and Baxter and like the whole, you know, circle of life, you know, starting over again. Um, so yeah, that was really when I was like, okay, like I think now, you know, I've got the outline of the plot and the structure. It's got such a message of, rebirth um i I'm, I'm just so lucky to to be interviewing you here I'm all you know, i still get pictures from kids holding the squash like their parents like they read the book and then they go to the store and they buy one and then 
you know, I get pictures yeah. of the kids and that's my favorite thing. All these kids looking at the squash, like it's like, it's their actual baby. Okay, so, you know? so, so next, next time I'll bring a squash. I, you know, I, yeah. I'm, I, I wasn't enamored to the extent where I'm going to go out and buy a mushy squash, but, but perhaps I should uh, for our <laughs> next, for our next interview. Yes, um, yeah. So you're, you, you've, since then you've published 22 books and now in our garden is book number 23. Yes. Not all have, 23 are out, but they're all sold. Okay. And uh, you have a whole bunch of Baxters and Bonnies uh, coming out this year. <laughs> and um, so, so I, I, you know, I don't know whether other people ask you the question, but I have chutzpah. Uh, the same thing happened to me in my scientific career. My first scientific article was very popular and it still is 40 years on. Um, and then I published a hundred other scientific papers, some of them good, some of them not, but none of them held a candle to my first paper. Um, given the stellar success of this perfect children's book, I know that every book you write, you want to be better, better than Sophie's, but what, what, what if that never happens? How can you beat the perfect children's book? I mean, I'm okay if it never happens um, because it happened once and that's good. Um, and I think I try to do something different with every book and I'm always striving to be better than I was. Um, and I think my books are good in, in different ways. Like um, Sophie has not sold the most copies of my book. I think it's number two, Be Kind, which was on the New York Times bestseller list has actually sold more. Um, and I think that was a case of it being the right book at the right time, you know, the right topic at the right time. Um, but yeah, I always try to just, what can I do? How can I be better? Like I'll read a children's book that I love and think, could I do something half that good? And then that kind of inspires me to go and try to write my next book. But I mean, I'll always have Sophie and she's always going to be like, you know, taking up a big spot in my heart. <laughs> As she should. And she does in so many millions of other people's hearts. So in our garden, which is a fantastic book. I mean, if I didn't know you wrote Sophie Squash, I would say, Pep, it's a fantastic book. And it is. Uh, as are all the ones I've looked at, but um, uh, where did the idea for this one come from? Do you remember the specific incident? The specific incident, this one was different than most because most books, I get the idea and then I write it and I hope somebody wants to buy it. This one, um, the editor that pulled Sophie Squash out of the slush pile, Stephanie Pitts, she was the one who found Sophie Squash and said, we should make this a book. She contacted my agent and said, would Pat write a book about a school garden? And so it was kind of like getting an assignment from your teacher. And I said, I could do that. So that was one where the topic was given to me, but then I had to figure out how to tell the story. Like she didn't give me a lot of direction beyond school rooftop garden. And it's a first person story. Yes. And um, what else I like about it is that the, the uh, heroine or the main character doesn't say necessarily where her idea came from. Uh, yep. And I think, I think that kids like that. And I always tell kids ideas can come from anywhere. There's not one right way to get an idea. I mean, I get ideas by reading other books. I get ideas by dreams. I get a lot of ideas by like listening to other people's conversations when I'm in the checkout line at the grocery store because people say funny stuff and you hear like parts of their conversation. And I'm like, I could work with that. Um, by noticing like odd little details and thinking, you know, why is that person wearing those socks or why, you know. But, but, um, but you, you run home and, and, and write the ideas down. What's your process? Yeah. Sometimes I've got a notebook with me and I'll, I'll jot a note. Other times I'm, I'll be driving home going, don't forget this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Do not forget this. <laughs> And then usually, of course, we forget it for a couple of months. I have forgotten some, some things that I wish I had, but no, usually I try to write it down. Or if it's an amazing idea, I'll just sit down and like, just start typing out something just to like, capture it for now. Yeah. So when, when, when you write a new story now, um, are like, um, do you ever get rejected? Oh yeah. Who's, oh, all who's, the time. Who's, who's going to reject Patsy Clo Miller these days? A lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Because when you, when you write a story, like it's got to be the right fit with the right editor. They have to kind of see the same vision for it that you do. Um, you know, and editors are like anybody else. They have like their own taste, their own opinions. And so it's got to like, you know, line up the right way. Um, and they also have to think that it's going to be something that will sell and be profitable. And so um, I, I sell books, but I also get a lot of rejections. And it's just now they don't bother me. It's just part of the process. You know, it's just wow. like onward, keep moving. <laughs> so, so let's go back now to Pat in the slush pile. Hard, mm -hmm. as this, hard as this is to fathom and imagine. 
So <laughs> you've, you've done your 10 um, revisions with your critique group. Yes. And then, and then what happens? Um, well, I had been sending, I didn't have an agent. Um, and so when you don't have an agent, you send it in just randomly to publishers that will accept it because some publishers won't look at your story unless you have an agent. Um, and then you wait forever to hear because, you know, they get tons of submissions and I mean, you know, it just takes a while. And so I had sent it out to several places. And honestly, I was sort of running out of publishing companies that would take unsolicited submissions. And so I was kind of on my last one or two. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe Sophie just isn't going to work. And I never thought about giving up, but I was feeling sort of resigned that maybe I was going to be like writing for myself versus writing for the world, you know? Um, but then I had sent it to Schwartz and Wade, um, probably eight months ago. And I had a spreadsheet saying what I had sent where, but I had sort of like not thought about it. And then they called, my phone rang and it said random house on the, you know, the caller ID. And my first thought was it's gotta be like a telemarketer. Cause you know, I, I just wasn't. And then it was Ann Schwartz in person on the phone. And she said, you probably don't remember sending us Sophie squash. I'm like, yes, one I second, do. Pat, Pat, one second. <laughs> you, you didn't know her. You didn't meet her at an SCBWI meeting. Nope. Random. Random House. Random House, Schwartz and Wade is an imprint of what Random House. No, no, I'm saying um, it, it, it was yeah. random. Yes, it, oh, it was random. It was totally random. Um, yeah, and Stephanie Pitts had pulled it from, because she was, I think, like a, a, a very junior editor at the time, and their job is to read the slush pile. And she had seen it, thought it had possibility, given it to Anne, and Anne, bless her, decided to take a chance on a brand new writer and called me up. And that, yeah, I was stunned and thrilled, and it was amazing. <laughs> That's that's totally incredible. So, you, you realize that this is like a. Um, I've interviewed maybe fifty authors, maybe a hundred. I can't remember. And nobody gets discovered from the slush pile, Pat. <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody. It just doesn't happen. You know, like you are like some kind of. Um, I'm an outlier. <laughs> you no, you're not an outlier. You're you're an outlier among outliers. <laughs> Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. So um, how do you how do you um, now encourage other writers? Because both of us know that um, you wouldn't have been discovered, you know, even though you've written this perfect story. Um, and with all your years of experience, you still were in the slush pile. And just by some crazy happenstance, you were discovered. Yeah. It, it's hard to talk to writers and say, well, you know, do exactly what I did and it'll work out the same way because it probably won't. It won't, right? <laughs> you know, the, the, the squash will rot and that's it. Yes. And, and everything will no, be mushy no, 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 no Bernice, no Bernice. No Bernice. Um, yeah. Now I just try to tell writers to, you know, do the things I did. Read as much as you can, write as much as you can, and then, you know, try to find an agent because your odds of success are going to be better if you're submitting with an agent. <laughs> And I have an agent now, um, but I didn't. I'm, I'm not surprised. So, so uh, when Random House calls you and they want to publish a book, it's it's easier to find an agent. So this is absolutely true. Yes. So, so how did that go? How did that work? Um, well, okay. So, I I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was just brand new, and so I thought, well, no agent's going to want me. You know, I'll just you know work with Random House and it'll be fine. And I had a friend. <laughs> I know. I know. What? <laughs> I'm coming off a of flu. I like, you know, three weeks phlegm is now coming up because you're so hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? So I had a friend um, who was trying to become published as an author, hadn't at the time. Now she is. Um, and she said, well, you're going to try to get an agent, right? And I said, oh, yeah, no. I mean, I just don't think it'll work out. And she said, Pat, you have to try to get an agent. So I had seen um, John Paquette speak at a conference, an SCBWI conference. And I had really liked her. I thought she was cool, but I hadn't submitted to her after the conference. Um, and so I sent her an email saying, here's my story. Random House made an offer. You know, what do you think? And she got back to me and she said, what else do you have? And I sent her, you know, other work I had in progress. And then this is the part I remember vividly. I was at my day job and I got an email and the email was from Joan and it said, you're so talented. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and that then, you know, she she repped me, 
handled Sophie squash and I would not have the career I have if it wasn't for Joan Paquette. Um, she, she submitted more of my books. She, you know, she was just, I mean, it just having the agent makes your life so much easier and she's great. Um, yeah. So I, I, my friend who suggested it is Jessica, Jessica Vitalis, who has a book out called the wolf's curse. And so I feel like I owe her lunch for the rest of my life because she was like, Pat, get an agent. <laughs> okay. So, so Pat, here, here's the thing. Um, and I asked the authors this question. Um, agents usually take on hmm, less than five um, new authors a year, usually maybe two or three. Uh, and picture book writers are competing with more successful commercial genres. Yes. Um, and they will go through thousands of manuscripts. So your chance in finding an agent. I know. That's why I wasn't trying. <laughs> not a, it, no, but one second. We want it. We want to try and give advice, um, mm -hmm. and the chances are less than one in a thousand. Mm -hmm. But you've written also about self-publishing. Self-publishing is a slippery slope because you you hardly ever get to where you need to be. So what do you tell? What do you tell the people who aren't there? Well, I mean, well, one is you have to try. I mean, even though the odds are small, if you don't try, it's never going to happen. Um, I do, I have met a lot of aspiring writers who write and write, and then they just keep the stories on their computer. And I'm like, well, if you don't try to get them out in the world, you know, you're, it's just never going to happen. So you have to try. Um, and then I think a lot of people try too soon. I know I did, you know, you, you write something and you're all aglow because you think it's so perfect, but yet it's, it's not. So you really have to like spend, put in the time to master the craft. So it's putting in the time and then just, you know, which of your stories are the most unique, which, which stand out, which ones have an angle that isn't there in the field. And so you also have to like read extensively. Like I wanted to be a picture book expert. I mean, I read everything. I mean, you can't see it, but all around my computer, I've got like stacks of picture books because that's what I do, you know? Um, so you have to treat it like it's a craft and like, you know, you have to learn it and you have to know who wrote what and why and what do you like about it and what don't you like about it. Um, so I, I, that's what I recommend. And then hopefully the planets will align and you'll produce something and it'll be seen by somebody that wants it. Okay. And if that doesn't happen, then? Then write because you love it. I mean, that's what I was getting to the point with Sophie. I thought, well, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't going to stop writing because I loved it, but I, I just didn't think it was going to happen. Um, but I mean, if, if you love it that much, you know, you'll keep going. And then, I mean, you know, there are magazines and I, I'm not sure I personally ever would have self-published. I, I don't judge people who do because everybody's got their own path to success. But for me, if, if I couldn't have gotten a traditional publishing deal, I would have just done it for me. You would have just kept it in your drawer. I, I would have just kept it in my drawer and well, I, I probably would have kept submitting, but I would have. I would have just written because I'm happier when I'm writing. Sometimes I get like caught up in the busyness of all the other things you have to do as an author and I don't write and I'm never as happy. And I mean, so I would have written just because it makes me happy. And um, so this has been a remarkable uh, conversation. Um, any other advice that you want to share with uh, people who are on their journey, who are on the road to quote the, one of your other books. Oh, oh, oh thank you, <laughs> wherever you go. I mean, I guess, I guess I'd remember everybody has a story, you know, and, and you have to find your story and, and figure out the way to tell it that's the most you, you know, don't, don't think, well, like, you know, pirate books are really popular, so I'm going to write a pirate book. You know, think, what's the story that I have that's the most important to me? And I think that's part of the reason Sophie Squash succeeded, because it was such a personal story to me and my daughter. You know, I mean, so think about write that what you love and then, you know, trust that somebody else out there is going to love it too. Incredible. Incredible. So, uh, Pat, what the, shall I wish you? Um, I think that um, you have not only had an incredible miracle in your life, but you've been able to share this miracle with young children and parents and grandparents from around the world. Um, and um, on behalf of those people, 
and those of us who teach your book as a perfect children's book. Um, thank you for writing it. Uh, and uh, thank Providence for fishing it out of the, uh, out of the uh, proverbial slush pile. Um, and I wish you to have another a Sophie squash or maybe uh, several more. Um, and uh, just to keep being the dy dynamo that you are and really an inspiration. And, and I'm just gonna end by saying, um, you're just such a nice human being. Oh, thank you. You know, there's nothing stuck up about you, no airs, you know. Um, and, and that is so gratifying. And I really hope the uh, people out there who are watching us and, uh, and listening on the podcast uh, will get a sense of your wonderful humanity. And it, yeah, sorry. No, I, was, I just feel really lucky because I mean, there's, I get to do what I love more than anything else in the world. And I mean, I've had other jobs. In fact, it was just in June that I started doing picture books full time. I quit my day job in June. And every morning I wake up and I just, I mean, I'm so fortunate that I get to spend my day with picture books for kids. And it just, it makes me happy. And so I, I, I very much recognize my good fortune. Yes. And I, I mean, I, I concur. I, I think that picture books are the most amazing thing uh, and writing them. And uh, for those of us who illustrate of which we are not those. I am uh, not that. I know I, I read about it, um, no, <laughs> nor I. Um, so this is a, um, I can't think of any higher mission. My only regret is it took these over 60 years to, uh, to reach the conclusion you reached in, um, in, in your thirties. <laughs> And, uh, I wish and, I had started sooner too, though. <laughs> and, that, and that no one has, is, is uh, well, it's not true. Um, somebody has taken something out of a slush pile. But um, it's not about me, it's about you. Pat, this has been incredible. Is there anything I haven't asked you? No, I think we've covered all of it. I just really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Oh, I'm like, I've been waiting for it, like for a whole month and a half. <laughs> I'm like, and I'm like telling everybody, you know, Sophie Squash, I'm interviewing the author. Yeah. <laughs> it's been wonderful. So, uh, Pat Zitlow Miller, uh, on behalf of the New Books Network, I'm Mel Rosenberg, the host of the Children's Literature Channel, and it has been fun and entertaining and wonderful interviewing you on your career. And good luck with your brand new book in our garden. Uh, soon, people in Madison, Wisconsin, and elsewhere will be able to take your book to the rooftops and build lovely gardens. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.